Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Strength to Strength. This morning we have Brother Chuck Pike um, from the Boston area on with us, and we are having another segment of the Patriotic Ambassadors series. This is a two-part, so we'll be having another um, session this afternoon at 3 o'clock. This, the special event today is called Plundering the Strong Man's House. So before we get started, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you this morning. We thank you for your mercy, which is new again today. We thank you that we can gather in this way, which just seems like a, a unique way to gather with the saints. But it has been such a blessing. Pray that you would be with Brother Chuck as he shares this morning. Give him clarity of thought. May your Holy Spirit rest on him as he shares your word. Just pray that you would be with each one of us and may our hearts be prepared to hear the truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, go ahead, Brother Chuck. All right. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. <clears throat> Get started. The, uh, the lesson today is plundering the strong man's house. And that may, may sound like a rather uh, strange title, but it's, it's a lesson on evangelism. And the title makes sense as we get into this. Uh, so this, the message this afternoon is also going to be on evangelism. But it, this, this, this first part is really on how to use the prophecies to convince unbelievers. And there's a little overview of the class to start off with. I wanted to just take a few moments to talk about how churches generally approach evangelism today uh, and contrast that with how the apostles did it in the beginning and then take a look at some of the common objections I hear to why we shouldn't do it the way that the apostles uh, said and, and my answers to those objections. And the question is, does the original way still work? Is it effective today? And if you wanted to do that, how on earth would you would you learn to do that? So that's that's an, an overview of the class. So it's really going to be about uh, Old Testament, how to use Old Testament prophecies. Now, a lot of churches will uh, approach seeking and saving the lost, and and maybe this may hit hit close to home. I'm not trying to insult anybody. As I've been in, in churches that, that do this this approach as well, is felt needs, and the idea is the old saying: you can attract more. Uh, ants or bees, whatever it is, with honey than you can with vinegar. So people think, all right, what does our church offer that most people want that they're missing? You know, their their children are out of control. The marriage is no good. Um, their finances are a wreck, or whatever. They have some problem in this life, and and so we'll say we can meet this problem for you in, in our church. You'll have friends. You'll have a a network of people who are caring and who are kind and who are honest, and, and, and your, your life is going to be better. There's something that you feel in your life that's missing that's going to be better if you become a Christian, and people reach out to people on this basis and construct programs around that. So maybe maybe that you know what I'm talking about. Another approach is uh, I remember uh, talking with a man who was a missionary in Central America many, many years ago, and I said, you know, what led you to become a Christian? He said it was basically fire insurance is the way he put it, is that on the day of judgment, he didn't want to be cast into the lake of fire. And so that was the motivation is, is really thinking about the end of his life and the day of judgment, that, that, that that's what motivated him to become a Christian. And so a lot of times people will pass out tracts. And this is, this is kind of really what it boils down to is they'll say, well, you're a sinner you're headed for, for, for destruction. You're going to pay the price for your sins on the day of judgment. And you need to uh, become a Christian. You need to accept Christ uh, in order to avoid this terrible fate happening to you. 
which you which you deserve. So this is this is another approach that people will take. Uh, and I want to contrast that with, a, with with one of the ways that Jesus expressed the um, the the evangelism, and and it's in the terms of a jailbreak, where he's he's basically. Uh, scripture that we're familiar with, it's in Matthew and, and Mark, it says, uh, rhetorical question, how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? Now the house, so the picture is that Satan is the strong man. Jesus is stronger than Satan is. He's a stronger man, but 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 the, it, in order to plunder Satan's house, now what is Satan's house? Satan's house is basically, it's a prison with people inside of it. So first says you need to enter the strong man's house and plunder his goods, but first you have to tie up, you have to bind up the strong man and then plunder his house. So you tie up Satan and then you, it's basically you're breaking into his house and plundering his goods, which are the people who are constrained in there. Um, and I want you to think about what what Jesus said to Paul, and there, there are three places in the book of Acts where Paul talks about his conversion, and this is the one in Acts chapter 26. The way, he, way Jesus explains to Paul what his mission is going to be. And so Paul's recounting the story of what Jesus said to him. And Jesus says to Paul, when he is struck blind on the road to Damascus, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So, so, um, I think about these two phrases in here, turn them from darkness and light and the power of Satan to God. So the idea is that the, the, the Gentiles that Paul is reaching out to, as well as the Jews, that they are in a state of darkness and they are under the power of Satan now, and he's going to pull them out of them. He's going to liberate them from that. That's the mission of evangelism. And this ties together with a couple of other scriptures. I think of Colossians 1.13, Paul says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness, or I think some translations will say dominion of darkness, and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. So we're leaving one kingdom and joining another one. 1 John 3.8, I think of that verse also. It says, For this purpose the Son of Man was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And I also think about this in connection with the, the whole Exodus story. In, in 1 Corinthians 10, and to a lesser extent in, in, in Hebrews, uh, in the beginning of Hebrews, and it's also alluded to in Jude, the, the whole journey through the wilderness, the whole Exodus journey, is really a foreshadowing of the gospel story and, and, and the Christian's journey. And it starts off with the people who were in slavery in Egypt. And then the Passover lamb is slain. They have to get all the yeast out. And they flee the land of captivity under the oppressive ruler who will not let them go in the kingdom of darkness. They pass through the water. And then they spend 40 years wandering around in the wilderness in a time of temptation and testing. And those who are faithful... Joshua and Caleb and, and, and the succeeding generation make it ultimately into the promised land, the goal of their desire. And, and this is the, the whole point that Paul is making at the end of 1 Corinthians 9 and, and the first, first half of 1 Corinthians 10 is that this is a foreshadowing of the Christian life. And there are lessons for us to learn in there. So when we think about this, you know, Moses, the one who is leading them out of captivity, is, is uh, foreshadowing Jesus. The, the, they were led by Moses and ultimately by Joshua into the promised land. The Passover lamb who was slain right before they're liberated is also is foreshadowing Jesus. The Red Sea, it talks about how they were all baptized in the cloud and the sea, the water and the spirit uh, idea. Um, they all ate the same spiritual food, drank the same spiritual drink. 
And the pillar of cloud and fire is foreshadowing the Holy Spirit. They were baptized in the cloud and the sea, the water and the spirit. The wilderness is the Christian life. It's after you're baptized, you've escaped from Egypt, but you haven't reached the promised land yet. And it's a time of temptation and it's a time of testing to see who's going to be faithful to the end. It's the Christian life. And so the three questions, what's the promised land? And I think we can, we can all figure out what that is. That's the goal that we're looking forward to at the, at the very end. It's not this life. It's, it's what we're looking forward to after death. And then other questions, what do you think Egypt in this parallel, in this foreshadowing, in this map represents? Well, it's the time before someone is baptized. They're in the kingdom of darkness, and they are oppressed, and they want to get out, okay? So, so Egypt would represent life before someone is a Christian. And then who do you think Pharaoh represents? He is the cruel oppressor who wants the people to make bricks without straw and will not let them go. Let my people go, and Pharaoh continually won't let them go. And then even as they're escaping, he tries to pull them back. So Pharaoh is pretty obviously, when I ever ask this question, everybody says, obviously, that's Satan. So this is the picture, is that the people are in bondage in Egypt, and they need to be liberated from that kingdom and brought into God's kingdom. So this is a battle. Evangelism is really a battle between two kingdoms, and the world is now enslaved in Satan's dark kingdom. So certainly the whole... The whole fire insurance looking forward to final judgment, that is part of the gospel message. But the message is, is goes beyond that. It's we're pulling people, they're now, whether they whether it looks like it or not, they're now in Satan's dark kingdom, enslaved. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. So people are in slavery, they're in bondage, and and, and we want to release them. And I believe the full story of the gospel, whenever I hear people say, I'll ask you, what, what is the gospel? Usually they'll talk about us and our sin and Jesus and what he did for it, but they never mention Satan. And really Satan, I want you to see, is a, is a major part. As Jesus explained it to Paul, and as we see in the, in the Exodus map, which is foreshadowing the Christian life, that, that you need to understand this is liberation from the control of Satan. So the, the total picture is God, us, and Satan, not just us and God, that we have a problem and, and Jesus is bailing it out. But he's, this is a war between two different kingdoms. So the liberation from the dark kingdom involves the Passover lamb being slain. And we're protected by the blood of the lamb, representing the blood of Jesus saving us. That the people must, after the Passover lamb is slain, as it says in 1 Corinthians 5, the Passover lamb is slain, which is Jesus. Now we have to get rid of all the yeast, which refers to sin. So you have to, so repentance is part of the gospel message also. And there is a spirit-led escape through the water, which is, as, as it says in 1 Corinthians 10, is baptism. So this is an overview in a beautiful way in the Old Testament of the gospel story. Now, how do... The a lot of a lot of Protestants present it this way, and, and even people who are not from Protestant backgrounds, when they want to become evangelistic, they will many times uh, turn to the Protestants and say, "Well, how do you do this?" And they'll say, "Well, there's the Romans Road." So people will hand out tracts, and it's one form or another of the Romans Road. And if you look at this, the message of the Romans Road, this is there are different variations, but they're all pretty similar. Uh, why Romans? Uh, I think it's because it is, was Martin Luther's favorite book, which is not a very good reason to, to use that as, the, as your template for evangelism. There's nothing in Romans about preaching the gospel to the lost or converting anybody. So, but it's a book that's written to people who are already Christians. And uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't turn there if I wanted to find out how does somebody become a Christian, how do you share the gospel. But we're all sinners by nature and by, or, uh, and by choice. We receive eternal life as a free gift. Uh, God loved us, uh, although, although we were his enemies, and he, he gave his son. We have to trust and surrender our life to Jesus. And then, uh, you know, assurance of salvation. It, it, a lot of times they'll throw in, you can't lose your salvation. So uh, somehow Romans 11 didn't make it in there. And Romans 6 about uh, dying to sin and being baptized didn't make it in there either. So a lot of, a lot of detours on the road to going through Romans that, uh, that get missed. So, but
But that's the idea. Now, you notice in here, anything about the kingdom of God? No. Anything about Satan at all? No. It's just us. We have a problem, and Jesus is taking care of our problem. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the classic presentation that the, that the Protestants use, and I see a lot of, of uh, people in our circles picking this up because they don't know what else to do uh, and, and using tracks that take this approach. So uh, now I'm a civil engineer by training. So, uh, you know, I'm not down on roads. We, we civil engineers, we build roads, but I'd like to, I'd like to do a little road improvement here, a little road improvement project on uh, So this is a, a representation of some old civil engineers and construction workers uh, fixing a Roman road or building a new Roman road. So what I like to do is say, let's, 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 let's go to the real Roman road. All right. Uh, what, you know, Paul, when he's writing the Romans, he's writing with church that exists. And at the time he's writing and he's never been there. So he's writing to Christians, addressing some things in there. But we actually have, at the end of Acts, Paul ends up in Rome and he's preaching the gospel to people in Rome. So I'm thinking, okay, you want a Romans road? Let's see what Paul actually said when he's preaching the gospel himself in Rome to unbelievers. That's a good place to look. And so from Acts 28, um, when Paul finally ends up in Rome, it says he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. And some were persuaded by the things which were spoken and some disbelieved. And then, uh, after it, so 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 I'm thinking, okay, let's let's use this as, as our approach to the Romans road. This is this is the real Romans road. This is the message that Paul delivered to the people in Rome who weren't Christians. First of all, he persuaded them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets. So he uses the Old Testament scriptures to convince people that Jesus is the Son of God. Is there anything about the Old Testament in the in the in the, the Protestant version of the Romans road. No, nothing about that at all. Uh, and then the other thing is he's talking about, so he's talking about that, and he is testifying solemnly about the kingdom of God. And then at the end of uh, of Acts 28, it talks about he's 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 preaching the kingdom of God for the next couple of years from a rented house. So the two things that, that I pick up from Paul, when he's preaching in Rome, is the message is the kingdom of God. And first of all, second of all, he's using the Old Testament to convince people, to persuade people that this is really true. So that should be no surprise that the apostles are taking this approach. This is the exact approach that Jesus taught them to take. I want to read from Luke 24. After Jesus is raised from the dead, he appears to the two on the road to Emmaus. And uh, he, he opens, it says he opens the scriptures to them. They're dejected because they had been followers of Jesus and Jesus was crucified, but they heard a rumor that he had was raised from the dead. So Jesus opens up the scriptures, the two on the road to Emmaus, and he explains that all these things had to happen based on what it said in, in, in the law and the prophets. And then he does the very same thing when he meets with the 11 apostles. When he meets with the, the apostles as a group, let's read from Luke 24. Uh, you have a Bible, you can follow along with me. Um, in Luke 24, starting in verse 44. Of course, this is after Jesus is resurrected. He is training the apostles. He's teaching the apostles. And what is he teaching them? Okay. Uh, starting in verse 44. See, so he, he gives convincing proofs that he is, he is uh, physically... There, it's really his body. He's bodily raised from the dead. Verse 44, then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. He said to them, thus it is written 
And thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So, so think about this. Jesus says all things had to happen in order to fulfill what was written in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. He opens their understanding, and he talks about the suffering, the death, and the resurrection on the third day were all in fulfillment of prophecy. So that's what Jesus is doing. After he's raised from the dead, he's explaining how he fulfilled, how his his life, death, and resurrection were all, were all fulfillment of prophecies. And then in, in Acts chapter 1, the beginning of Acts, Acts picks up right where Gospel of Luke ends off in, in Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 1. It says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day which he was taken up after through the Holy Spirit. He had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Excuse me. <clears throat> To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So Jesus is speaking about the kingdom of God, the apostles. Speaking about the kingdom of God, he explained how to fulfill the prophecies. <clears throat> so when Paul was preaching, when he goes to Rome, He's doing exactly what Jesus had trained the apostles to do in the beginning, is preaching the message of the kingdom of God. And after all, I think it's Matthew 24, Jesus says, this message of the kingdom will be preached to all nations, and then the end will come. So same two points. Preaching the message is the kingdom of God and, and the fulfillment of prophecies after Jesus is resurrected from the dead. That's what he's doing. So <clears throat> now... One of my great frustrations in life, in, in teaching the Bible, is I'm reading through this, and I read Luke 24. Jesus finally explains to the two in the road to Emmaus and to all the apostles how he had fulfilled the prophecies. The unfortunate thing is we don't have anything specific that he said in those two addresses. So we don't have what he told them. And if we want to know what Jesus told them, the only thing I can think of doing is to look at what they actually taught in the book of Acts and then reverse engineered and go back and figure out, okay, this must have been what he taught them because this is what they're doing. And so that's really what we're going to do is, is to, 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 to figure out what was the message that Jesus taught or major elements of it based on what the apostles are preaching. Now, the apostles throughout the book of Acts, the book of Acts is the best place to look, I think, if we want to look at how did they in the beginning convince unbelievers and how did the gospel spread? I would look at Acts and not Romans. How, how do you, so how did people become Christians? And what was the message that was preached to them? If we go to Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching at Pentecost. <clears throat> and uh, he's preaching that Jesus has been raised from the dead, and he's preaching the message of the kingdom of God. So let's, let's turn to Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you uh, by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you've taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, and there's a quote from Psalm 16, where it says, uh, verse 20, uh, 27, you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor you allow your Holy One to see decay. And then picking up again, verse 29, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you. 
of the patriarch David. He was both dead and buried. His tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus, has, this Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. So he's preaching the resurrection of Jesus as the fulfillment of Psalm 16. You will not leave my soul in Hades, nor you let my body see decay. And he explains that couldn't have applied to David himself. It had to apply to the son of David, who was prophesied in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Also in 1 Chronicles 17, repeats the story. <clears throat> and it's a prophecy that says that the uh, there would be a, son of date one of david's descendants would build the temple and he would be the king over an eternal kingdom he'd be referred to as the son of god and it says that he would be raised up okay and peter just says well this this king and the kingdom he actually was just raised up literally physically raised up and then he says in here he says God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to flesh, he'd raise up the Christ to sit on the throne. Well, it talks that the prophecy is given from Nathan to David in 2 Samuel 7 and 1 Chronicles 17. And then it's repeated in Psalm 89 and, one, and Psalm 132, where it says that the Lord swore to David with an oath. So Peter isn't quoting that, but he's alluding to those Psalms as well. And then it talks about he has, he has not only been resurrected from death, he's also been raised up to heaven, and he is Lord of all. So Peter is preaching the resurrection of Jesus and the king and the kingdom of God by quoting or alluding to several prophecies here in the Old Testament. One, two, three, four, five, six places in the Old Testament in this passage right here. So we learn a lot from that. In Acts chapter 3, there's actually uh, some very interesting things in there, too. So Acts chapter 3, Peter heals the, the, the crippled man in Solomon's, at Solomon's portico. And so this, again, is in Jerusalem. He's speaking to the Jews. And in verse 17, he's preaching. He says, now, brethren, I know uh, you did in ignorance, as did your as did your rulers, but these things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, is thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted. Your sins may be blotted out, so times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And he may send Jesus Christ, who has preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the time of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you, and it shall be that every soul who will hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. You were sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with the fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning uh, away every one of you from your iniquity. So the approach Peter takes here again is, he says, all the prophets spoke about these things which we've just seen, the things that were foretold by the mouth of all his prophets. And here he quotes a different passage in scripture. It says in Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 to 19, that that Moses recounts that on the, on the day of the assembly, which would be uh, Exodus 19, 20, when the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to speak to the people, that he says that at that time that God had also told him, Moses, that in the future he would raise up a prophet like him from among their brothers, and everyone must listen to what he said. So, Jesus, Peter is making the point, Jesus is that prophet. He's the prophet who was like Moses. He leads people out of, out of bondage. He's the one who brings in new laws. Unlike any, all the other prophets just said, follow the law of Moses. Moses brought in new laws. So a prophet who would be like him, as Eusebius points out in, in proof of the gospel, would be one who would bring in, bring in new laws. 
So he had the authority to do that. So he was the prophet who was like Moses, who God raised, God said he'd raise him up. And that's the point that Peter is making here. If you read what he's saying carefully is that God actually did raise him up. But that's a fulfillment of the prophecy. And he also quotes from, it's in Genesis 22, but also other places in Genesis, where it says that all families will be blessed through the seed of Abraham. So Peter is explaining that that's fulfilled by Jesus also through the seed of Abraham, referring to Jesus, one person. And then there's an interesting comment here that baffled me for, for quite a while. It says, all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow. Now, Samuel is born in 1 Samuel, or conceived 1 Samuel chapter 1. He dies in chapter 25. And so I ask people sometimes, can you think of any prophecies about Jesus in 1 Samuel? Okay. <laughs> a lot of people are stumped by that. But you go back and take a look at it in 1 Samuel chapter 2, there's a prophecy where God says, I will raise up a priest. It's the same, same word, I will raise up a priest. And um, and, and it talks about, in, in, the, in the Septuagint, the word there is Christ. He, 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 it, it speaks of, of the word Christ shows up there as well, so in, in, that, in that prophecy. So I think the writer of Hebrews is referring to this, where he says in Hebrews 2 and 3, he talks about Jesus is the faithful high priest over the faithful house. That's from 1 Samuel chapter 2. So I think when Peter says, for all the prophets from Samuel on, uh, that uh, that, uh, he, that he's alluding to, uh, to to something specific there, and I think that's what it is, my opinion. So in Acts chapter 4, Peter is before the Sanhedrin, and they, of course, have rejected Christ, and he says the stone makes it personal. The stone you builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone from Psalm 118. Another prophecy about Jesus is that he'd be rejected by the religious leaders. Um, Acts chapter 8, there's the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. And Philip goes along, he's alongside the chariot, and he hears the eunuch reading from Isaiah the, the prophet. And he's reading from Isaiah 52, 53, and he's, he's puzzled. And he says, well, who is this talking about? Is the prophet talking about himself, this suffering servant, or someone else? And so it says that he he uh, uh, that uh, he, he began with that scripture and preached Jesus to him. That's in Acts chapter eight. So is Isaiah fifty three, uh, the suffering servant about the crucifixion of Jesus. The, the famous prophecy is 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 mentioned there to the Ethiopian eunuch. In Acts chapter ten, Peter is in the household of Cornelius. Cornelius is a Gentile, but even to a Gentile. Uh, who, who's a God-fearing Gentile, Peter says in, in Acts chapter 10, uh, he says, to him all the prophets witness. So Peter goes back and points to the fact that Jesus, the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus was foretold by all the prophets, even to a Gentile here. Acts chapter 13 uh, is a, a wonderful account of Paul preaching the gospel to us in a synagogue in Pisidian Antioch, which would be in Turkey today. And he alludes to the kingdom prophecies, just as Peter did, 2 Samuel 7, and those other prophecies that talk about the king and the kingdom. He alludes to that. And then he also talks about Psalm 2, which, which points to, to the, the Jesus being rejected by the rulers of this world and also being specifically the son of God um, and then being raised from the dead he quotes from Psalm 16 just like Peter did and in Acts chapter 15 this is this is I just I just uh, figured this out within the last last year or two here that this was uh prophecy about Jesus. I figured out what Peter's saying. They're having, a, they're having a meeting in Acts 15 with the apostles to figure out what do we do with the Gentiles who are coming to faith? Do they have to follow the law of Moses? Do they have to get circumcised? What do we do with them? They have to become Jews first. And you know, Peter tells the story of the household of Cornelius, how the Holy Spirit came down, and, and the vision he had about the um, you know, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. 
the, all the unclean animals in there, which, which indicated that the Gentiles could become Christians directly. But I, think, I find it interesting what James says to wrap up the argument in, in Acts chapter 15, starting in verse 13. And after they became silent, James answered saying, men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as is written, after this I will return and rebuild the, rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even the Gentiles are called by my name says the Lord who does all these things. So think about what he's saying. He's quoting from Amos chapter 9, which I never thought about as a prophecy about Jesus. He says, after this, I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. That's a poetic way of saying it. Peter uses the expression in 2 Peter about, I'm about to put aside the, the tabernacle or tent of my, my body but he's looking forward to a permanent structure in the future. So this is a way of a figurative way of saying his body. So it says, I'll rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. That's a prophecy about the resurrection, the, the, the body of Jesus, the tabernacle of David. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up. So the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even the Gentiles. So, so that's the application that, that James is making. Well, the tabernacle of David has been restored and raised up, so now it's time for the Gentiles to come to faith. So it's a wonderful prophecy about the resurrection and the Gentiles coming to faith and seeking the Lord after that. Uh, so, so this is clearly, you go through the book of Acts, this is how Jesus taught the apostles to spread the gospel. This is how they did spread the gospel, and we saw several examples in that Peter, Paul, uh, Steve, uh, Stephen uh, uh, did, did it as well. We didn't we didn't cost, uh, talk about that, but they all use the Old Testament to prove that Jesus is the Christ. And the, the, the objection I get all the time from Christians is they say, "Yeah, but that's because they were speaking to Jews. This wouldn't work today. They're using the Old Testament because they were talking to Jews, and they buy, buy that, but they didn't have the New Testament around either. So this is the objection." And uh, but I I have a uh, I overrule the objection I, I I rule that one out as an out of order objection so it's overruled. Uh, can I go to First Corinthians chapter fifteen? And I love what it says there. Paul says, speaking to the church in, in Corinth. Now in chapter twelve, he, he already if it wasn't clear that this is a predominantly Gentile church, you think about some of the sins that he's addressing there, because obviously people from Gentile backgrounds. And, and he comes right out and says it in 1 Corinthians 12 too, you know you were Gentiles carried away by these dumb idols wherever you were led. So that's they're from Gentile background overwhelmingly in that church. And he says to these Gentile Christians, I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And then he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, what does it mean according to the scriptures? It means in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. To say, this is what I received and this is what you received in the beginning. This was the foundation that was laid for their faith in a Gentile church, and, and just like just like Peter did with the household of Cornelius. So this is the way the gospel was spread, not only to the Jews, but they used it with the Gentiles as well. All right. I want to read a selection here, Justin Martyr. So Justin Martyr is writing around the year 160. Now Justin is a Samaritan. He's not Jewish. He was a Samaritan philosopher. And in one of his writings, I think it's Dialogue with Trifo, in the beginning, he talks about how he personally became a Christian. And it was, he, he became a Christian being convinced by the Old Testament prophecy. So he'd studied philosophy, but he, he, someone, he encountered a man once who explained Jesus from the prophets. He went back and studied the prophets, and lo and behold, he became a Christian. And then he used the, the prophecies to convince others both Jews and Gentiles. And in uh, this, I'm reading a selection, it's a, a modern updated translation of uh, Justin Martyr's first apology, and we don't speak great things, we live them. 
And uh, I love this. It's a, it's a beautiful explanation of the Christian faith. And so after, def after defending against all the false accusations that are being made uh, about the Christians, he then goes on offense and he says, not only should you stop persecuting us, but you need to become Christians too. And he's writing this to the, the, the leaders of Rome, the Senate and the emperor. <clears throat> and I'm going to read from there, <clears throat> from this work. Uh, we don't just speak great things, we live them. Uh, carried by School of Publishing. This is on page uh, 114. He says, centuries ago, there were certain men among the Jews who were prophets of God. Through these men, the prophetic spirit foretold things that would happen in the future. As these prophecies were spoken, the prophets arranged them in books in their Hebrew language, and the various kings of the Jews preserved them. And then he goes on and says, explains how about 200 years before the time of Christ that the for the library in Alexandria, they had the uh, some Jews come down and translate into Greek. So, I mean, who could who could read Hebrew back in those days? But everybody could read Greek, so it was accessible. And uh, then he says he goes on, he explains that, and he says in the books of the prophets we find prophecies about Jesus our Christ. They foretold his coming, his being born of a virgin, growing as a man, his healing every type of disease and sickness, and even raising the dead his being unrecognized and hated, his crucifixion, death, and resurrection, his ascension to heaven, and his being the Son of God. It was also predicted he'd send persons into every nation to proclaim these things, and it would be primarily the Gentiles who believe in him. Uh, his, his, uh, his appearance was predicted by a succession of prophets through the centuries. And then he goes on, he says, that, he goes uh, through, he says, uh, some 5,000 years in advance, over three others, 3,000 and 2,000 and 1,000, finally 800 years in advance. So I'm, I'm not sure I agree with his chronology there, but his, uh, his points are dead on. And then later on, he, he lists after this, he, he, he mentions several prophecies. And then he comes back and he says, this is on page 124, he says, I could quote many other prophecies, but I feel these are sufficient to convince you. See, he'd rattle off several <clears throat> Uh, to convince those who have ears and understand. I think it's obvious we're not like those who tell fables about the so-called sons of Jupiter. They talk, but they have no proof of what they say. Why do you think we believe a crucified man is the firstborn of the unbegotten God? Why do we believe the same man will judge the whole world? We believe because of the prophecy spoken about him before he came into the world and was made man. We see these things have happened just as they were foretold. We've seen the devastation of the land of the Jews just as it been foretold. We see people of every nation to be convinced by the teachings of the apostles and turned away from the old traditions by which they had previously lived. As one of them myself, I see that the Gentile Christians are both more numerous and more faithful than those among the Jews and Samaritans. I feel these prophecies I have quoted are sufficient to convince anyone who is open-minded, free of prejudice, and truth-seeking. Now, so he, so here, here's, here's his attitude. His attitude is, if you're seeking, if you're a truth-seeker, we have the proof and the evidence, and I just gave it to you. This is all prophesied uh, hundreds of years beforehand. And so he, 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 he challenges, are you really, basically, are you really a truth-seeker or not? That's the approach that he takes. He takes the high ground of reason, logic, and evidence, and he proves the faith from the Old Testament, which is just what the apostles were doing in the book of Acts. All right. So that's what first question, first, first objection was it was just to the Jews. Well, that's that's that was used for the Gentiles as well, and saying, no, we have evidence of this. That this, these are the prophecies were written long, long uh, beforehand. You can read them yourself. The other thing is, well, that may have worked in the first century, second century, but it probably wouldn't work today. It probably wouldn't be very effective today. Well, uh, you know, <laughs> I can say it really does work. It's really quite effective. And I'll give you a few examples, not just <laughs> just a more, a few more recent examples. Uh, many of you know Finney Caravilla, and it was his father. His father was an agnostic in India. And he went and heard a lecture where someone said, how many people do you know whose life history was, whose biography was written hundreds of years before they were born? 
Okay. And then he began with Psalm 22. And this, this got Finney, Finney's father going. And uh, I mean, just amazing all the, 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 the wonderful things that have come as a result of that. So that's, that's one example. And years ago, uh, I was with my family. We were, we were living in, in Albania, which was, it was, it was a historically uh, predominantly Muslim country. It was under Turkish occupation for about 600 years. And uh, so uh, we got into some discussions with, with Muslims there, people from Muslim backgrounds. And, and I asked them a question, thinking, do you believe in Jesus? Oh, yes, he was a great prophet. Do you believe he's the Christ? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, do you believe that he died on the cross and rose from the dead? He's the son of God. I say, no, we don't believe that part. I said, well, what do you mean? You, you believe all the other things? You don't believe that? And they said, well, the Christians changed the New Testament. And that's what they say. Any Anytime there's something in the Quran that contradicts the Bible, the New Testament, they'll say the Christians changed it. No evidence, no proof, no nothing, but that's what they claim. And so I threw them a curveball. I said, Actually, I don't need the New Testament. I can prove to you the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus using the Old Testament prophecies that were written centuries beforehand are in, are in the, have been in the possession of the Jews who don't agree with the Christians. So it will be impossible for the Christians to have changed the Jewish scriptures. And they had no comeback for that because... There is no comeback for that. You can't say the Christians changed the Jewish scriptures, which the Jews had control of beforehand. So it was, it was a wonderful way, and, and it completely threw them off their game. They didn't know what to, they didn't know what to say about that because this is the standard. The Christians changed the story. I mean, think about it. The apostles didn't have the New Testament, and they proved from the scriptures using the Old Testament. Um, years ago, I, I had a discussion with an evangelist, the church I was in. I said, uh, they're teaching the book of Acts. And I said, you know, he said, well, what should we be doing in our, our midweek gatherings? I said, well, you know, you're teaching the book of Acts. How about we look at how the apostles in Acts use the Old Testament prophecies to convert people? It's very interesting in evangelism. I said, that's a great idea. So I, I, I laid out this wonderful picture for for how what we, what we would do. We'd have, we'd have a series about how to do the, how, to, how the apostles did this, how they prove it. And, and I did such a good job of convincing him that he said, all right, Chuck, I want you to teach the whole thing yourself. And I was kind of, kind of like, whoa, what did I get myself into here? So, so I, I taught the first class. I, I said, all right, here's, here's the bar we're going to set here is I have to prove beyond any reasonable doubt from the prophecies that Jesus is the son of God. He said, this is going to be the standard, which you're going to have to judge me at the end of the class. I hadn't written the other four classes yet. So I was, I, I boxed myself into a corner, but by the end of the class, when we looked at all the prophecies, people were convinced. And somebody told me, after I handed out notes because I wanted people to, with all the prophecies, I handed out the notes in each of the classes. This is the Prove It series, which it's on the Historic Faith website now, uh, it was turned into a, a video. But uh, uh, somebody handed the notes from the class to a person who was, uh, uh, who, who was from China who was in this country, and they just hand him the notes. And, and, and later they came back and said, did you take a look at the notes? And what do you think? Uh, you, what do you think about Jesus? And, and do, you, do you think he's the son of God? What do you think? He says, well, I have no choice. The evidence is overwhelming. <laughs> this, was the, this was the conclusion. They just handed them notes. They looked at the prophecies uh, on their own. So does this work today? I think it does. And I've used it with people. There was a guy who was a... Uh, uh, a, a postdoc doing research who was from, from uh, China, who was living in the U.S. and uh, didn't believe in God and uh, used it with him. And he, he ended up coming to faith and, and getting, getting baptized. I just talked to him uh, this past week. Uh, he's back in his, his, uh, his home country dealing with the, the challenges there. Uh, I'll tell you another story. When, when I was in Albania, there's a, a guy who... Uh, became a Christian as a teenager, all right? Very, uh, he's going to the, the top top high school in, in, in the country, and he became a Christian, later emigrated, you know, Albania's a very poor country, he emigrated to Canada, so lost touch with him for many years, and he popped up later on, and he had become, what he said, an atheist, and he was an atheist blogger. He's a, he totally lost his faith, and so, 
I said, well, you know, if I could prove it to you, would you, would you, would you become a Christian? And, and so I started sharing some of the prophecies with him and some lessons that I had taught. And he came back and he said, no one has ever explained the faith to me this way. He said, it's all based on emotional appeals and there's no logic or proof behind it. He says, what you're doing here, I don't know, I don't know what to do with this. He said, it certainly seems like this is talking about Jesus. He says, but I need to be convinced that these prophecies really were written uh, before the time of Christ, because it's obvious that they're talking about Jesus. So, so he went back and actually contacted some rabbis and started studying the Old Testament with rabbis to find out about more about the Old Testament. I lost touch with him. And then uh, he popped up again a couple of years ago. And he said, I studied this out in the Old Testament and I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm a believer. I, I'm convinced by this. So he was somebody who was an atheist blogger. And now he's going after the other atheist bloggers with reason and evidence. And he, he was, you know, at the time he's, he's going for his, his uh, uh, doctorate in some field of mathematics or statistics, something like that. He's a, a bright guy. So, but, so people tell me, oh, that would never work today. As I said, that's, that's nonsense. <laughs> it, it definitely does work for people who are, are truth seekers. And, you know, then people say, well, all right, Chuck, that, that, you know, it's, it's, you're, you're a Bible scholar, okay? So, so you can do this, but I could never do something like that. You know, I'm, I'm not a Bible scholar. And I say, well, I'm, a, I'm a civil engineer. I'm not a Bible scholar. No, I, have, I have zero sem seminary training. I've never taken any courses, formal coursework on the Bible, anything like that. I'm pretty much self-taught. And, and besides which, in Acts 4, Peter and John, it says they were uneducated and untrained men. They're fishermen. So they're, they're, they're good blue-collar, hard-working guys. And they, that's just, they could do it. So why can't, why can't any of us do the same thing? You don't need to be a Bible scholar. You don't need to go to seminary to do this. You just need to, do, just need to know the scriptures. And I'm inspired by the example of Apollos in Acts chapter 18. It says, a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. This is a hero to me. This is the kind of guy I want to be, someone who is mighty in the scriptures, who knows the Old Testament and can prove, can demonstrate, can show the unbelievers from those scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. And if Apollos could do it, why can't we? Now, a couple of things. Okay, this isn't, this isn't the magic cure-all for evangelizing every single human on the face of the earth. And knowledge has got to be combined with genuine love. So <laughs> let's not ever forget that. You also, you can't be a hypocrite. Uh, the, the, the hip, uh, religious hypocrites are the, that's the last place you want to be. So you don't have to be perfect, but don't be a hypocrite. And you have to combine the gospel you're presenting with love. The other thing, the other thing that I want to remember is uh, never forget, just like John and John 3, Jesus said, this is the verdict, lights come into the, into the darkness. Men love darkness instead of light because their e deeds are evil. And those who, who, who love the truth come into the light, I'm paraphrasing there. So this is, it's a spiritual battle. We're doing battle against Satan and the forces of darkness and the sin in people's hearts. The reason most people reject the faith is because they don't want to repent. It, once they've heard the gospel in a in a compelling way, because they don't want to let go of sin. So there's going to be plenty of people who won't become Christians, regardless of what we do. And we need to understand we're in a spiritual battle. So the proving the faith is, an, is, is a, a powerful first step, but there's more to it than that. But like Justin Martyr said, he challenged the Romans. And I do the same thing with people today. I'll I'll take, you know, this is throwing the gauntlet down. I'll take the glove off and throw it down, challenge them. And my challenge to unbelievers is I'll ask them if I could prove to you beyond any reasonable doubt 
based on reason as evidence and logic that Jesus is the son of God, would you repent and become a Christian? And that backs people up <laughs> right there. It's a very bold way of sharing my faith, but that's, that it really is what I do. If I have a relationship with somebody, I'll, I'll challenge them, saying, I want to know, are you truth seeker or not? And, and those who are really truth seekers are, are going are gonna to rise up. And those who aren't, that'll become uh, pretty clear, too, if they start backpedaling at that point in time. Because people really want to know the truth. And I, I threw a few. Some, somebody says, I, OK, Chuck, I, I'm on board. I want to do this. I'm going to turn myself in. I want to become like Apollos, mighty in the scriptures. I want to be able to prove it and, and, and share the faith just the way the apostles did in the beginning. I said, number one, read the Old Testament intensively. Look for prophecies there and, and, and have Apollos as one of the men that you want to become like in terms of, of his power and impact and knowledge and scriptures. And study the book of Acts. Go through the book of Acts just like we did uh, briefly today. And go back and read all the prophecies that are quoted or alluded to. Sometimes there are prophecies that are alluded to that aren't directly quoted. So you can't just look at the footnotes in your Bible. And then I, this is my personal thing, I, I've been inspired by some of the early Christian apologists. I mentioned Justin Martyr, his first and second apologies, and his dialogue with Trifo, which is a masterpiece in terms of explaining the Old Testament. That, that, uh, that really opened up my eyes to the power of, of using the prophecies. And then another one that, that isn't so well known, uh, you know, that the Justin Martyr's works are in Ananiasine Fathers, Volume 1. Eusebius' is a Proof of the Gospel, which is, which is brilliant, and it, its use of the Old Testament, some, some real gems in there, too. And then uh, 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 for those who uh, are looking for a shortcut, I, I hate to say this, but my, on, our, on our House Church website, our Walking My Faith website, you do a, 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 a Church of Christ in Woburn, uh, we have lots and lots of audio lessons and some links to video lessons about using Old Testament prophecies to convince people in, in things I've done over the years. So uh, so I'll, I'll close there and open it up for questions and discussion. Thank you, brother. I know you've challenged my perspective on sharing Christ. So why wouldn't we use the model that Jesus actually used himself? That's beautiful. I love it. Um, let's have some questions and comments. Actually, a question I have is why, why do you, why do you think we've strayed from that model or why do you hear of all these other models instead of just teaching people Christ from the scriptures? Um, uh, boy, that's a good question. I don't know. It's so, yeah, I, cause I look at this, it's so obvious, man. I went mm -hmm. to a church that focused, like Protestants focus on the Book of Romans. I was going to Church of Christ that focuses, hyper-focuses on the Book of Acts. And we didn't, yet we never, it never occurred to us uh, to take that approach. And I, I think the biggest reason is the objections. The objection number one is, oh, they did that because that was for the Jews. Mm -hmm. So I think people write it off. Well, of course, they use the Old Testament prophecies because they're talking about Jews. But uh, we have to find a better way today of doing it. And what they don't get is that they use it with everybody, not just the Jews. Kind of the impression I get, and you touched on this as well, um, it's, health, it's helpful to, ha to have a relationship with someone if you're going to share the gospel in this way. And it seems like it's kind of human nature to have, we want something easy. We want something quick. So it's easier just to walk up to somebody and say, um, you know, maybe use a Paul Washer approach where are you a sinner? And if you're a sinner, you're separated from God. And so you need Jesus. Yes. Um, you know, we, we want the little five minute delivery instead of spending the time and doing the hard work, build the relationships and out of those relationships, um, teach people about Christ. Right. Yeah, uh, we were, uh, my wife and I, for decades, were in, a, in a, a movement that really focused on relationship evangelism, building relationships, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what I'm going to be talking about this afternoon is our experience mm -hmm. doing that, but that is absolutely the, the approach that we were, we, were, we were drilled in. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Does anyone else have questions or comments?
Sam, this is Joel. I would, I would just say that uh, on August 26, 1980, a friend of mine started suggesting I read the Bible, and I was an agnostic slash atheist. And uh, I said, it's a, a fable. If you're going to create a fable, you might as well create the hero perfect. And so that's how I saw it. I was 20 years old, and he was also 20 years old. He said, but what do you think of the Bible? And I said, well, it's, it's a myth. Again, that men made up, they're going to make it perfect. And he said, but have you read it a lot? And I said, no, never. And he says, well, I thought you wanted to be an open-minded person, Joel. I said, well, I do. I think it's silly to not be open-minded at new facts. He says, but you're rejecting the Bible without reading it. And so I read it all through the fall and the winter of 80, in the winter of 81. And then in the middle of April of 81, he got me to go to a soul talk and where people discuss the Bible. And uh, the very first time I sat down with one of those new friends from that soul talk on the campus at University of Cincinnati, he, that friend started with the dispensations of Abraham and Moses. You know, and I'm, I'm you know, I'm just been reading the New Testament for six or eight months. But it told, and then he summed it up with Jesus died for your sins. Because he told me all of human history. I was, I was blown away. I'd heard Jesus died for your sins when I went to Episcopal Church occasionally, but I never knew what it meant that Jesus died for your sins. I was blown away. I was in the middle of April of 81, and I was sitting there reading my Bible, smoking my cigarettes. My, my New Testament smelled like an old stale bar. I'd smoked so many cigarettes and read my Bible so much for the last six, eight months. If you flip through it, you know, and it smelled like an old bar. And, you know, a month later, I became a Christian. I decided to live this way. So uh, Chuck knows it works like he's beautifully explained over the last 40 years of him doing these things as well. So I'm very thankful that uh, God has done this for us. So thank you, Mr. Pike, for explaining it all the more for, for us. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Yeah, just uh, one question here. So um, it's, it seems like people are, even the even Christians are almost um, Old Testament illiterate. Um, and so much more so in, in the world where people might know about Jesus without even knowing the Old Testament, especially here in, in our postmodern uh, Western culture. So uh, like this is a pretty monumental task to... Uh, not only convince them of the Old Testament being true, but um, even even a step before that, that any of the scripture is true. And um, he started talking about, a, you know, the Bible, or, you know, they're going to say, why that holy book over any other? So is there almost a, an apologetic prior for some people uh, prior to, to this with uh, convincing them of, of the scriptures? Um, different people will do it different ways. Um, the, the, the attitude that Justin took was these things were written beforehand that told in detail about something that just, that just happened afterwards. How the approach that he took was, how is it possible that every detail of the life of this man, the life, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, the, every aspect, the destruction of Jerusalem. He's saying every aspect of all the, all of these things were all foretold by all these writers hundreds of years in advance. So his, his attitude is, how can you possibly explain that unless this is the real deal? And, and that's kind of the approach that I have taken is say, um, how could these people have known in detail all these things? How, how could all this have been laid out if it wasn't the Spirit of God doing it? So I'll start with that, with the fulfilled prophecies, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, rather than, you know, does God exist and, and should we take the Bible seriously? I and mean, I'll take the questions as they come up, but that's the approach that I take. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you for that. 
There was a question came through on the chat here. It says, with a logical approach to evangelism, do we lose the ability to personally connect with an individual as the approach endeavors to prove them wrong through evidence rather than to show them the right way through a life example? Well, I think that uh, the the it, it's not logic is is uh, is logic is our friend. Okay, the the, uh, the the God created logic and reason, and this is it, Apollos is demonstrating from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Paul's doing the same thing in Rome. This the approach that they took was, and you know, but they're also preaching repentance too. You know, it's woven into everything. Peter, Peter goes right into save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And so they're talking about people's lives as well, but they're saying, no, this really did happen. And you need to clean up your life. And in in Athens, Paul is saying, all right, God put up with this for a certain amount of time. Now he's commanding all men everywhere to repent. So um, it's not just the logical proof, but it's saying, no, these things really did happen. This is the, the, the faith is not based on a feeling that could vanish tomorrow. It's based on historical fact. That's what Paul's telling the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15. This is the foundation of your faith. Jesus died and rose from the dead in fulfillment of the prophecies. Okay, this is historic fact that really did happen. This is mm-hmm. this is not built on this is not built on manipulation or feelings. Now you need to deal with your heart and repent, but uh, that, that's 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 completely woven in with the gospel. So to me, it's not either or, but but uh, it's really good for, for if, if for both of them together. Mm-hmm. I'm grateful that it is logical. Um, in listening to you know a debate between evolution and a creationist or something like that, they always try to paint the creationist as some somehow. Uh, pie in the sky faith you know type fairy tale and then try to frame evolution as the logical and it's actually the, the reverse um so I'm, I'm grateful that the story you know the hit the history is there i mean you don't have to just take it on a it is by faith but there are some logical conclusions to come to in studying it yeah, that, that's a big difference I saw between the early Christian apologists and, and most Christians today is their attitude is we are the ones who are based on truth, faith, reason, logic, and evidence, and you're the ones who are based on superstition and feelings, and you're irrational, and we're not. So that they took, they took the high ground and never gave it up. And this, this modern business about, well, it's just something you have or you don't have, and it's a leap of faith, that is not the way they presented the gospel. We need to re- regain that perspective for sure. Amen. Mm-hmm. Amen. We'll have time for another comment or question if there is one. If that's it, we'll wrap up for this morning. Um, Like I mentioned before, we are having another segment of this Plundering a Strong Man's House this afternoon at 3 o'clock Eastern Time. And, of course, you're all welcome back for that as well. Um, Thank you, Brother Chuck, for sharing this morning. Um, It was a a wonderful, wonderful lesson. And I'm going to have to watch it again uh, to get down those points. Um, So thank you. And would you close us with prayer? Yes. Thank you very much for for having me. Uh, Father in heaven, Lord, uh, open up our minds that we can understand the scriptures, that we can see you more clearly, that we can present you uh, humbly, honestly, and powerfully uh, to, to, to those who are truth seekers in the world. Father, pray that you will equip us as men to walk in the footsteps of Peter and Paul and Apollos to really know your scriptures, to love them, to see Jesus all over the Bible and to be able to persuade unbelievers, just like Paul did did in Rome by by presenting them 
uh, with, with Jesus and the fulfilled prophecies and the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms, the way that Jesus taught the apostles. Uh, Father, I pray that you will bless the brothers here who listened to this, that, that, that they, can, they can process this, and I uh, pray that your, your spirit will work in their hearts and their lives uh, to help us all to be more effective in presenting the gospel. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks again. All right. You're all welcome back here again in just under eight hours. And I'm looking forward to it already. So Amen. enjoy your day. Go with God. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. <laughs>